9-11 and the dot-com era helped launch something new, the conspiracy theory industrial complex, moving conspiracy theories from the fringes to the mainstream and making them profitable. And here's where things get tricky. Sometimes the conspiracy theory turns out to be true. And some skepticism is key to holding people in power accountable in a democracy. But too much skepticism can lead to a world where, to paraphrase Hannah Arendt, we begin to believe everything and nothing, think that everything is possible and that nothing is true. And if nothing is true, how does a democracy survive? I'm Rand Abdel Fattah. And I'm Ramtin Arab Louis. Coming up, we're going back to the earliest days of the internet to trace how we ended up in a world that can't be believed. Part 2. Truthers. America did not know when the 9-11 attacks began. We didn't know when they were over. We looked up and there was a plane. Next thing you know, we heard boom. Open explosion is just a code. Everyone is running from the entire financial district now. The smoke is still in For most of us, 9-11 was a jumbled mess of confusion and uncertainty. But Alex Jones, broadcasting from his home in Austin, Texas, was on air claiming to know exactly what happened. They were CIA uh, with double passports and, and were being protected. And they thought they were taking part in a hijacking drill that day. You can't find his broadcast from that day anywhere online. But here he is summarizing his thoughts in an interview years later. And then what really happened is they nerve gassed the people on the planes from the best info we have, then remote controlled them into the towers. Alex Jones becomes really the first voice of what we now call 9-11 trutherism. 9-11 was an inside job. Don't believe anything the government tells you. Hour by hour, you see this split between Bill Cooper and Alex Jones on the radio. Don't report rumors. Don't report anything that comes over your fax machine. Don't report anything that you hear from Alex Jones. Bill Cooper was no stranger to outlandish conspiracy theories. But Garrett Graff says Cooper always thought he was telling the truth. The only thing that I want to hear about are facts. I think what he saw emerging in Alex Jones was a willingness to lie. Bill Cooper died just a couple months after 9-11. He was killed in a confrontation with officers at his home. Alex Jones is left as the sort of last conspiracist standing. And, and But it gets worse. What I'm saying, there's thousands of pieces of data. They didn't find one. They found two hijackers' passports unburned. September 11th, 2001. 9.47 a.m. Hi, baby. I'm, baby, you have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I'm on the plane. I'm calling from the plane. Jules, this is Ryan. Uh, listen, I'm on an airplane. This is an hijack. I don't know if I'm going to be okay. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I just want you to know I absolutely love you. I love you so much. I love you. Bye. I remember the day very clearly, as many people do. I was waiting to start basic training. I had gotten my head shaved. I had gotten my my equipment and we were just hanging out normal morning you know doing pt it was a beautiful day and then all of a sudden we just got this call from the drill sergeant everybody form up so everybody fell into formation and they walked us into you know the media trailer uh, where there was a tv and it was your old four three square tv with the long extension cord and then they turned on the tv i thought it sounded kind of loud, um, louder but i looked up 
and all of a sudden it smashed right dead into the center of the World Trade Center. And we saw the first tower burning. I remember literally less than two minutes that we were watching, and then the next tower was hit. And there's more oh, explosions there's, oh, right now. Hold on, people are running. Wait, so hold on. on just a moment. We've got an explosion inside. The building's that... exploding right now. you got people running up the street. Okay. Hold on, I'll tell you what's going on. And I remember going for a run because I didn't know what to do. I was, this was not what I signed up for. I did not mean to get into the situation. And I remember collapse in the woods and I started to cry. Just staring up at the canopy in the woods and just being utterly terrified of what I had gotten myself into as a young 18 year old boy. And now I was deployed into a war that I didn't understand. The reality that we existed in changed on September 11th for everyone on the planet. Ramtin, what do you remember about 9-11? Wow. I know, softball question. <laughs> That's a big question. Mm-hmm. Uh God, what do I remember? I remember the intensity of it, the feeling of fear, not just around the attack and the horror of seeing like the TV coverage of the attack, but also just like what's going to happen to us because it felt like Mm -hmm. the kind of country's attention was focused on Muslims, you know, being Muslim American. There was this feeling of uncertainty. And Mm -hmm. I think for the very first time, I was very aware of my identity that we're different yeah uh like almost from day one i don't remember if it was on 9-11 or like soon after 9-11 but i remember there was this reporting coming out that my community in particular this north jersey arab american community that was like right across the water from new york where the twin towers were hit that people were celebrating in the street i remember those stories i mean i wasn't seeing any of that i knew that you know, in our home or in the mosque or wherever, like people were talking about f- how afraid they were. They were mm. they were confused. They had no idea who had done this. They yeah. didn't know why. You know, my dad and his friends would be on the couch. Like TV was on 24 hours a day. Mm-hmm. They were just watching the coverage on like CNN or whatever and arguing about this country is responsible, that country is responsible, kind of all the mm-hmm. uncle level mm-hmm. conspiracy stuff. Yeah, I, I, I distinctly remember like my dad being like, you should be suspicious of people in power. Um, whether we're talking about a cleric or a Congress member, they need to be held accountable. And I think a lot of that sort of, I don't know, I guess skepticism, I, I remember starting to see it make its way online. Yeah, I, you know, I went off to college and I was on the internet all the time, early internet. And I just remember just the amount of these different, very complex conspiracy theories. None of us knew what was coming on September 12th. What aren't they telling us or in October? Especially in the years after 9-11. Or in 2002. Like with the Iraq War, the Patriot Act, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib. What are they telling us that is completely false? I think there was a lot of feeling that we weren't getting the whole truth. When you have a situation that is so complicated, you need to turn to fiction to help reason through it. You seek to make order out of chaos. Societies around the world have subscribed since time immemorial to conspiracy theories of one sort or another. There were conspiracy theories in the Revolutionary War. There were conspiracy theories in the Civil War. In the weeks after 9-11, we learned that 19 members of the Islamist group Al-Qaeda had hijacked four commercial planes. Two hit the towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. One hit the Pentagon outside Washington, D.C. And the fourth one crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. The attacks killed nearly 3,000 people. The leader of Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, was believed to be hiding in Afghanistan. On my orders... The United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps. My local paper did an article on me. The headline is, Terrorism Must Be Dealt With, which is a quote from me, uh, because that's what I believed. A week after completing basic training, 
Corey Rowe was deployed to Afghanistan. And a couple of years into his service, Corey learned he was being redeployed to Iraq. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. It was 2003. The Bush administration had contemplated an invasion of Iraq since 2001. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. President Bush consistently connected Iraq to the war on terror, even though there was no clear evidence for Iraq's involvement in 9-11. But the thing that tipped the scales was a claim cited over and over again by Bush administration officials. Simply stated, there is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction. Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. Many media outlets across the country reported credulously on the administration's claims most prominently, the New York Times. And with their help, the administration sold the invasion to the American people. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. We were the tip of the spear as you know, George so, W. Bush so. gave his ultimatums to Saddam Hussein. Corey served from 2001 to 2005. He witnessed so much death. He told us about an experience he remembers that still haunts him. She was about six or seven years old. He says a young Iraqi girl was brought to the hospital where his unit was based. And half of her head had been blown off by a bomb that was dropped from our Air Force onto what was considered a target. Before long, she died. And her father came outside. And he sat down next to me and he said, why are you here? What are you hoping to do? And when he got back home after that tour in 2004, he noticed a lot of people had been asking the Bush administration the same thing. Why are you here? Why are you here? What are you hoping, what are you to, do? hoping to do? War is not the will of God. War is never pleasant. So many different things were happening. The families of 9-11 victims were suing the government. Demanding more information about what happened on 9-11. And the anti-war movement was really building. Now Americans were divided. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You were with us or against us. That's what President Bush said. Corey wasn't really sure where he fit in that with us or against us equation. He was a soldier, yes, but he had serious doubts about the wars he was fighting in. Doubts that intensified after it was revealed that there were no weapons of mass destruction being manufactured in Iraq, and that the administration, with help from some in the media, had started a war on false pretenses. I was mad at the United States government. I was mad at the military. I was mad at myself to be part of this machine that killed, now that we know, over 100,000 innocent people. When Corey returned to the front lines, he began expressing these doubts in his letters to his best friend back home, Dylan Avery. You know, it's just like a standard envelope that had, like, red and blue hatch marks around it. So, like, whenever I go out and check the mailbox, you know, I immediately look and see if I see that red and blue. This is Dylan. There were times where I would see a newspaper headline and said three killed in Afghanistan helicopter crash and there were no names and I would just have to wait and and hope that I would get another letter or get an email saying that he was okay. While Corey was deployed, Dylan was spending a lot of time at anti-war protests. He'd grown up in a pacifist household where NPR played nonstop. There was a poster that we saw at a lot of like the rallies and the get-togethers, which was 9-11 Truth Ends Wars. And Dylan had access to something Corey didn't. What do you think the greatest gift of the holidays is? Internet? I'd say internet. The rise of the World Wide Web had transformed the internet into an easy-to-use network that anyone could navigate. You can have communities of... Welcome. 
thousands of people, millions of people, right, contributing to the narrative. You've got mail. And now you could find them all in your own home any hour of the day. From a conspiracy perspective, you're always finding new doors to open. I was just like, I gotta, I gotta do something. Dylan began to spend a lot of time in his college library. The internet there was much faster than his connection at home, searching for any information he could find about 9-11. He figured he could piece it all together into some kind of movie. I was just making this movie, like, just to get it out of my system. Like, I was just, I was pissed off. When Corey saw the first cut, he got it immediately. When I watched it, it was just as clear as day of how important this piece was and what he was trying to do with it. Corey decided to leave the military to work on this documentary with Dylan. Fact-checking wasn't a real thing back there. Uh, It was more about what's the best information that we have available today. Let's go with that. By 2005, the documentary was ready. They called it... Loose Change. It's a collection of small things that add up to be something greater than their parts. 959. New York City, New York. The South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses to the ground in approximately 10 seconds. 29 minutes later, the North Tower follows suit, collapsing in approximately 10 seconds. The building's tenants included the CIA, Department of Defense, IRS. It definitely feels like a lot of things mashed up together. You're taken from one claim to the next, screenshots of declassified government documents and ground zero footage playing. Though there are elements of truth to some of the claims, many of them have been outright debunked, including the idea that the Twin Towers were brought down by a planned demolition. But their core message fed into a popular idea online, summed up by an early meme. Bush did 9-11. In the beginning, Corey and Dylan had mostly just handed out DVD copies of Loose Change. But now, they put out a second edition online. And it went viral. We were number one on Google Video. An early streaming service. Because what happened was he uploaded it in English, and then somebody in South Korea would download it and and re-narrate it or subtitle it in their language and re-upload it, and then someone in Germany would do it, someone in Japan would do it. We were the lightning strike, and it happened at the perfect time where video sharing is starting to take off. People are starting to not trust the war, which means that people are starting to not trust the government, which means that people are starting to question what else they've been lied to about. There was no advertising model in place for viral videos yet, so they weren't actually making much money off of this. We needed money, so we took a loan from Alex Jones. Alex had such a huge platform. And we started working on Final Cut. Loose Change, Final Cut, would be an updated version of the original documentary. Alex Jones was an executive producer. We generally did not understand the danger that he could bring to what we were doing. By now, it was 2007, and there was a way to make money on the internet. A new video streaming service called YouTube let anyone post a video online independently. And whether it was a video of a cat or a conspiracy theory, as long as people were watching, advertisers were paying. Alex Jones realizes that there's really good money in these conspiracies. Just type in Pentagon tested gay bomb on Iraq. They considered, though they didn't consider using it. They've used it on our troops. He got involved in more projects. He also got louder. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay. For Corey and Dylan... Enough was enough. They started taking Final Cut down. We don't, we don't want it being out there because we don't want any association with Alex Jones. He didn't have our and the movement's best interests at heart. We split up and went in our different directions. I mean, it, it was a bit of a relief. I was tired of just like having to just live inside 9-11 for so long that, you know, I was like, all right, I don't have to do this anymore. Meanwhile... Alex Jones was building an empire. As the 2000s unfold, wherever there's a conspiracy, there's Alex Jones. Barack Obama runs for president. Jones spreads the theory that he's not a U.S. citizen. 
the Great Recession hits, Jones says it was orchestrated by shadowy forces. A mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary takes the lives of 20 children between 6 and 7 years old. Jones tells millions of listeners that it's a hoax. They're recycling a green screen behind them. Above all, he sells the idea that all of this is being engineered by a shadowy deep state. He was speaking to that same feeling of powerlessness and frustration that Bill Cooper had channeled back in the 90s. The difference was, once Jones had your attention, he then tried selling you on all kinds of other things. Dietary supplements from his brand, InfoWars Life. Disease organisms like bacteria and cancer cannot survive in an alkaline environment. And apocalypse prep gear. Covert phone and voice recorders, powerful binoculars, security systems, hidden safes, and much more. The apocalypse for Alex Jones turns out to be really profitable. Profitable to the tune of tens of millions of dollars each year. I think he really sort of pioneered, like, the whole shtick. He's using the internet uh, in a very effective way in terms of getting you to the store that a lot of people have then subsequently copied. By 2016, the InfoWars website had millions of visits per month, and many of Jones's disciples were potential voters. Corey remembers when he realized what that meant. There was a moment in American politics when everything changed. And that was when presidential candidate Donald Trump went on Alex Jones's InfoWars. And Alex interviewed him. Uh, they became friends. Trump becomes sort of the conspiracist in, in chief. And thanks to social media, he was able to share those ideas directly with voters. In 2018, Alex Jones was removed from Twitter, now X. And all InfoWars content was taken down from YouTube, Apple, and Facebook. But not before he helped get the word out about a new conspiracy theory called QAnon. The post began soon after Trump said this in October 2017. Could be um, the calm before the storm. What storm, Mr. President? You'll find out. And while it has been widely disproven, QAnon has led to real-world consequences. Police say that Welch told them that he showed up at the D.C. pizza restaurant to get to the bottom of what appears to be an utterly bogus story about child abuse promoted on the Internet. On January 6, QAnon's presence in the mob was unmistakable. There have been many think pieces drawing a direct line between 9-11 trutherism, an idea loose change helped popularize, in our current climate of conspiracy. Corey doesn't agree and says traditional news media who have amplified all these false narratives over the years are way more to blame. Now, he says, he just tries to tune out all the noise. What I want to do is what I can control, what I know to be true in my own world, raising my family and my girls and my businesses and, and living a life that's important to me on my terms because the world around me is fucking crazy. But then, like, where do we go for information? Where do we go for the truth? You go to yourself, because it doesn't ultimately matter what the truth is, right? Doesn't it, though? Does it? Does does the truth matter? That's a great question. Does the actual truth matter anymore? 